Hey, I'm Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground. Welcome to this week's episode of The Underground, a program that explores the testimony of the biblical prophets, the gospel of Jesus Christ, current events, and how all of these things relate to you and me. Now, on this episode, we are going to come back to a topic that we've been talking about a lot, quite a bit, the past um, couple of years. We're going to come back to the topic of Mount Sinai, the Exodus, um, the Red Sea miracle, and we're blessed to have Tim Mahoney uh, with us as a guest. Tim is the, um, the creator and the director um, of a series of films. We've had him on as a guest before, but he began with the first film, um, dealing with the Exodus. Tim, welcome to the program, first of all. What was the name of your first film? Forgive me for forgetting the name. Oh, that's okay. Joe, it's great to be on your program. And the first film was called Patterns of Evidence, The Exodus. Okay, and then we, we actually interviewed you on part two, and part two, go ahead and tell us the name of that as well. So what happened was the Exodus, uh, I was always planning in this investigation to move from the Exodus on to, the, to what we're working on now, but in the middle of it, I started to realize with so much criticism against the authorship of Moses as the author of the Torah, that we created another film called The Moses Controversy. And the controversy was around the fact that did Moses have the ability to write the first books of the Bible? And that was our second film that came out. Yeah, that was fascinating, just dealing with the issue of, um, of language, the origin of language, the dating of Hebrew and Paleo-Hebrew and, and all of those kind of things. Uh, just everything that you do is fantastic. Um, I, I relate to you in a lot of ways because... I understand, I, you know, years ago I started doing documentaries and I thought, yeah, I'll do a documentary. And then by the time that I was done with what I thought would be a 90-minute documentary, I had three documentaries, easy, and I'm going, how can I consolidate all this information? And it expands and it grows. But the reason is because you research topics thoroughly. You dig deep and you go, well, I can't move on to this until I deal with this. So now you've got really the third installment, you've got the Red Sea Miracle, but and I haven't watched, I've watched the, uh, the trailer, the preview for it, but in looking at your website, you've also got the Red Sea Miracle too. So tell me how this is working. Well, as you, as you alluded to, when you're in a documentary mode, literally, I mean, we have thousands of hours of footage and, you know, all these interviews that are in depth. Sometimes I'll talk with someone and uh, I'll, I'll spend... I'll come away with 10 hours of interview footage from one person. And um, I can think of probably, I've sometimes interviewed people like four or five times, and then you add up all that. So I might have 20 to 30 hours of interviews on just one person's point of view. And so the Red Sea Miracle Part 1 is, uh, it, it got divided into two parts because I realized that in order for you to understand really how the Red Sea locations came to be identified, you had to have more context. You had to be able to understand where it all came from. So we, we go back to the origin of the narrative and going back to, you know, in Hebrew, the Red Sea location is called Yam Suf. Yam meaning sea, then the big question is, is what does this word Suf mean? And later on, that Yam Suf uh, was translated when uh, it, the, the Torah was translated into the Septuagint, uh, into Greek, they shifted that word into be calling, calling it read, a Red Sea, Red Sea. So we go from Yam Suf in Hebrew to Greek, Red Sea. And eventually, people started to look at it and wondered if there was an Egyptian connection. If these Egyptian words influenced the Torah, and that's when they started to see the word Suf and started to think about Patufi, and we're wondering if this meant sea, a place of reeds. So that's how the Sea of Reeds idea came into play. And so in our first film, we try to unpack that uh, investigation. And we're looking at then two different viewpoints. One I call the Hebrew approach, and the other one I call the Egyptian approach. And that's the, they're at odds with, with each other there. Right. I assume, um, I assume, do you interview Glenn Fritz in the film? I do, yes. 
and he takes the Hebrew approach. Right. Yeah, his book is fantastic. There's someone else who um, explores and digs into a topic unlike few others. I mean, he really, uh, you know, almost beats that horse dead, but his book is absolutely fantastic, The Lost Sea of the Exodus, and he deals with a lot of the essentially the historical confusion that revolves around that word, uh, as you said, Yam Suf, and, uh, and also the, the issue with regard to the understanding um, of the geography of the region, and, and it's pretty fascinating. I love, and I'm not sure how much you guys get into that, but I love that he demonstrates that really before uh, the 1800s, you really can't find a map that clearly describes and, uh, I mean, lays out the shape of the Sinai Peninsula. It's more of a nub at best. And there was a lot of confusion regarding the geography. And so that confusion combined with some of the confusion over etymology and this type of thing, it it all kind of added up. And then you throw in modern scholarship, and it's... um, it really is a bit of a mystery to untangle. Yes, and, and that, uh, that's the reason why we decided that uh, this investigation had to be put into two parts. Uh, and so we are going to explore, really, in this, the pattern is another six-step pattern. Uh, the question is, as well, where did they depart from? And as you know, all the Patterns of Evidence films looks at the scripture and looks for key identifiers that we could use to basically hunt for evidence. And the first one is, you know, where do they depart from? Uh, Because between that location where they they departed from, and and then there was a destination. So you've got departure and destination. And that destination was Mount Sinai. Moses was, was at a mountain when God spoke to him in a burning bush and said, bring these people back to me to come to worship me. So you've got a departure point and you've got a destination. And uh, in between there is a sea that was crossed. And so this pattern that we're looking for goes departure, direction. Once again, again, the question is, is where is the land of Midian? Because Moses uh, had fled to the land of Midian and he was with his, his, you know, the question then would be is, was he with his, with his family in the land of Midian when he, when he came to the mountain? And, uh, and then we go from, so we got departure, direction, and then we've got a desert. And these two different viewpoints have completely different deserts that people are declaring was the desert that the Israelites, you know, passed. One desert is a small desert, and the other one is a larger desert. And uh, I'll just share with you that an Egyptian approach really believes that the, the majority of this event of the sea crossing happened right near Egypt at the border lakes, the, the weedy, reedy lakes of the border of Egypt. But the Hebrew approach says, no, that's not right. They're saying that Moses was clearly telling us that the sea that was crossed was the Gulf of Aqaba. That is the Yam Suf. And so that's the tension between these two different viewpoints. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I touch on in my my little book, um, Mount Sinai in Arabia, is the fact that when you really do, and I think Fritz touches on this as well and, and does a great job, when you really look at every example in Scripture, I mean, again, if we're talking the Hebrew approach, at the use of Yam Suf, where it's mentioned in the Bible in connection to other geographic markers, every single time it's referring to the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aqaba, as opposed to the Suez or the Reedy Lakes um, on the western side of the Sinai Peninsula. The only possible potential exception is where it talks about the locusts being driven out of the land of Egypt toward the Red Sea. Some translations will say into the Red Sea, um, but really if you look at the original language, it's in the direction of the Red Sea. So even that is, uh, it's not a support text, so to speak, for the, the Suez location, but really every other reference, it's pointing to the Gulf of Aqaba, the Red Sea, Ezion Geber, Eloth, modern-day Elat, and that's a pretty devastating. Uh, I mean, that's a pretty devastating argument that the overwhelming evidence biblically points to the other side. Whereas, now l- let me ask you this along these lines, because you always you you always interview a great lineup of experts. Um, of those that you interview, how many are open to the Gulf of Aqaba versus the more traditional um, 
Well, um, I found that there are Hebrew scholars that, that are very notable in our film, uh, Dr. Dwayne Garrett and Dr. Jason Derushi. Uh, both of them uh, actually have worked, uh, you know, developing uh, he, uh, books on the Exodus and Hebrew, and they're very adamant that the that the Sea of the Exodus is the uh, Yam Suf is the Gulf of Aqaba, and uh, I think that that then there's this whole other group that are saying there are multiple Yam Sufs, that there's more than one, that 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 yes, that they won't argue the fact that that. The, the geography over there at the Gulf of Aqaba, uh, that that wasn't, you know, identified as Yam Suf, but what they're saying is that there's many Yam Sufs. There could be, and, and so I, I always raise the question is, I thought the reason for calling something uh, by a name was so you could find it, <laughs> you know, so you could, and, and, and there's an identifier too, you know, when Moses basically, God tells Moses, you know, about the boundaries of Israel, he definitely gives the name Yam Suf, that, that the boundary would be from Yam Suf to the Sea of the Philistines, which would be the Gulf of Aqaba up to the Mediterranean as one of the boundary markers. So uh, this is the fun that we're going to have with this, this film. And, and uh, as you know, these investigations, uh, I do a lot of recreations in them. Uh, we have a lot of animation. We are showing you uh, maps in different places. And we've really had uh, people have said that they think this might be our best film yet. Uh, and it's very, very inspiring for people. It just one guy said, "I just wanted to jump up and shout," you know. And, and uh, he wasn't shouting at us; he was shouting with us. He was excited about it. But that's fantastic. You know, a lot of people ask; they'll, they'll leave a comment or something on a video, and they'll just say, "Who cares? Why does it matter? Who cares where Mount Sinai is? This type of thing." And it's amazing because it really betrays a certain um, Christian mentality. Whereas, you know. Christians tend to, um, when we come to the Bible, we come to the New Testament, and we sort of treat the Old Testament as almost supplemental. Um, but when you really look at the Bible as, let's say, Jesus' Bible or the Apostles' Bible, you know, before the New Testament was written, and to understand, uh, I'll call it the biblical narrative or just the entire story of redemption, if we really understand the story, if we were to paint a picture um, of the biblical narrative, at the beginning, you have this looming mountain called the Exodus and Mount Sinai. I mean, this is the grand foundational story for the entire book. You get into the prophets, they're just pointing back to the Exodus. They're just pointing back to the Theophany at Sinai. And, and then on the other side, of course, you have Mount Zion, which uh, represents the, the culmination, everything that Mount Sinai is, is largely pointing to. But the Exodus, Mount Sinai, this is not just another Old Testament story. It's not like you have David and Goliath, you've got Samson and Delilah, you've got, you know, this, and then you've got the Exodus, like just another in a series. No, this is the foundation for the entire book. And, uh, you know, the other thing I've been thinking about is, like, the way, that, the, way the Lord normally works— you know, I've been a believer now pushing 30 years, and I've seen some pretty amazing things. I've seen some miracles and this sort of thing. But even when I've seen some amazing things, things that should be convincing to anyone, there's always still a little bit of doubt. There's always a little bit of doubt. And, you know, even people that followed Jesus around, and, and they literally did, they followed Jesus around during his ministry and they saw him do miracles. They, they sat with Jesus personally, and they walked away in unbelief. You know, there's even the example there at the end of Luke where Harry's come back in his glorified, resurrected body. You know, they're with him in his glorified, resurrected body. He's come back from the dead, and it says some of them doubted. You know, and so this is the way no, the Lord normally, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't just rip the curtains open most often. He, he allows room for doubt, and I believe the reason for that is most often he wants us to grow in our relationship with him, and relationships are built on trust and faith, and so he wants us to grow our faith and that sort of thing. But here's the point, is that that is not how it was during the Exodus. That is not how it was at Mount Sinai. He pretty much did rip the curtains open. He pretty much did 
I mean, it's to the point where they're at the bottom of the mountain begging, please, Moses, tell him to stop talking. You know, he comes down in a cloud, in fire, in earthquake, and a blasting of trumpets, and he's speaking from the, the top of the fire, the top of the mountain is on fire, and they're terrified, they're trembling. Like, this is a very unique event, and therefore, as a result of this, throughout the scriptures, uh, the Lord is saying, remember, 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 remember. And we live in this age now where the majority of the world, it seems as though, uh, is turning to unbelief, you know, uh, intellectual atheism and just so on and so forth. It's aggressive. They're aggressive. The church in the West seems to be getting weaker. Um, when you really look into the field of Exodus scholarship, you know, a lot of them don't even believe, they just believe it's a myth. Much of the Jewish world doesn't even believe it. And yet, here we are at a moment in history, and Tim, I really believe that there is a sovereign hand on this project, on what you're doing, because I really believe it's at this moment in history that the Lord is, once again, he's pointing back and he's saying, remember this, you know, and, and actually anointing you. I know it's probably been a pretty painful process working on this all these years, but anointing you to very carefully, like a detective, pull back the curtains so that the world can look at it if they're willing to pay attention, if they're willing to listen and say, wow, that, that really is real. The craziest stuff in the book, the evidence is there, it's real, it's right there for anybody with eyes of faith who is willing to believe, who's not just determined, bound and determined not to believe. And so it's an awesome thing that you're doing. Um, just, I want you to touch on this. I know it's probably kind of personal. Since, I, you know, because this whole Exodus, Sinai thing, this was not my thing, and I've said this a million times. I'm a missions guy. Um, I love talking about the return of Jesus. I'm a prophecy guy. And the Lord, all of a sudden, just sort of pulled me in through some interesting circumstances um, to be able to uh, go to Saudi Arabia. Of course, everyone who's watching this knows, I believe, Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia. But the warfare over the past two years has been like unlike anything I've ever encountered. Talk about just personally, what is, what's, what's that been like for you? Have you, I mean, I don't know how many years you've really been in this project, but just touch on that, because to me, when you see that Satan's raging, when you see the hand of the enemy, to me that really just betrays that you're touching something that's very close to God's heart. Yeah, well, I think, uh, as, as I mentioned, um uh, I always, I, I've, I've said this multiple times in the past week. Uh, when I came back from Egypt, you see, I had a crisis of faith in 2001, or 2002, I should say, when I came back because I had asked if there was any evidence for the Exodus. And I was told that, you know, so far not by Dr. Manfred Bitek. And when I came home, uh, I was in, in my office because in the beginning I had a project. This was just one project. I had a business that was making films and commercials, and I was fairly successful at it and had my own office and, and staff. And so I would work on this project on the weekend. So I came in on a weekend, and I was watching this footage, and I was looking at Dr. Manfred Bitek, or, or Egyptologist Manfred Bitek, and I was, I was looking at the footage, and I was trying to ask God, what does this mean? Because he's saying he hasn't found any evidence. And, and I sat there, and I literally started to, to cry. Because I said, you, I, I, I was, wanted to know what the truth was. And this thought then, I want to tell you that the room actually felt like it got cold. And on my left-hand side, this thought came into my mind, everything your family has believed about the Bible, that your mother has believed about, about the Bible, that it's a lie. And I, a cold, uh, uh, most desperate, uh, horrible feeling of lostness came over me at that moment. And I think that it's very possible that there are many people that have experienced this sense that what if none of this is true and I'm just believing in a lie. And at that moment, like that, uh, another thought came into my head on this side and said, stop editing, get up. It was, like, it, was, it was like a command. I just got up, go to your office. And I walked to my office, read that book. I mean, this was the thought in my head. And it was very clear. And somebody had given me a book earlier uh, by David Roll. Uh, it was called Pharaohs and Kings, and I had looked at it. I have lots of books. I have bookcases. You know, I've got different libraries uh, where I've collected resource material, um, just as I'm sure you do. And uh, so I pulled that book out. I hadn't looked at it. I opened it up, and 
uh, providentially, the very dig site of Manfred BTEC that I was, I was looking at in the edit suite was being addressed in this book by David Roll. And, but what he was showing me, in almost just a matter of minutes, I could see that he was identifying the fact that underneath this city of Ramesses, so if there's a city here, there's another city here underneath it, this is a much older city called Avaris. And that is where the story, the narrative of, the, of Joseph and his family coming into Egypt. And that's when I made a decision that I had to go to England and had to interview David in 2000, I think it might have been 2002 or 2003, uh, it might have been the fall when that started. But it's taken 12 years for me to really mature and to understand. And I'll have to be honest too, is that in the last four months uh, while I was working on this film, because there's, our films are woven together with many different threads, uh, trying to understand how big this is. And some people have looked at it and go, wow, this is huge. And uh, I was so discouraged because the risk of trying to sign the agreements to distribute and everything that I was about ready to close it all down. And, and I just felt like, you know, if I, if I agree and I can't really, you know, deliver, then I've got a huge penalty, a financial penalty. And it's always felt like there's so many financial risks that you take and professional risks you take with making these films and being them in theaters, you know. But I had, so I had about three nights where I didn't sleep. But then I realized, you know what? I have to be, I have to keep my word. I have to finish what I said I would finish. I can't just, you know, walk away. And I'm not going to be able to walk away. I need to do, I need to just have faith. And I think that there's a lot of people that are like this in, in our lives that we come to a place where, you know what, you really can't go backwards. You, you have to just say, I just have to trust God and I'm going to have to go forward. And we did. And all of a sudden things started to come together. The editing, uh, you know, like opens and different clips. I just had a sense. I knew what we were supposed to do. And our team, we were able to put it together and pieces started coming together literally much faster than we've ever seen before. And so... I, I, I was surprised that as we started to present it, you know, the film to other people, they said, this is probably the most powerful film that you've made so far. And um, I'm thankful for that. And, and I'm in the same place. But it's like I had to have faith that even though I couldn't see necessarily how this would all come together, because there are so many work, moving pieces making a complex investigative film, as well as making it artistic with all the animations. And uh, my animators also said that they've never experienced as much difficulty and trials in trying to put this together. They, they felt this was so different than anything that they've done before because they've had so many setbacks. That was one reason why I was so discouraged in the fall, you know. So, yes, it's been a real, real challenge. For real, for real. You know, I, I, uh, when I visited Saudi Arabia for the first time uh, a couple years ago, I got on the plane and um, I was just glowing um, in terms of I was just absolutely it for me it was the single most faith stirring and energizing experience of my life by the same token the, the warfare was tremendous but I was sitting on the plane when I say glowing like I was just like I, I was just at Mount Sinai like it just it was amazing and I'm looking at pictures and I sat down on a plane in Amsterdam, and um, this fellow right next to me, I could tell right away, New York Jew, you know, you could just tell by his accent. And he goes, oh, where are you coming from? You know, did you just come from Zurich or something? I said, no, actually, I, I was actually in Saudi Arabia. He goes, what, what were you doing there, you know? I said, well, believe it or not, I, I actually think I was just at the real Mount Sinai. And he goes, immediately, he just goes, oh, come on, you know none of that stuff's real. And I turned to him and I said, well, are you observant? And he goes, oh, yeah, I go to synagogue, this and that. He goes, but these things are myths. You know, and immediately that, that just onslaught. And, and he goes, German higher critical scholarship has disproved this stuff a long time ago. And, you know, I looked at him and I said, well, you do realize German higher critical scholarship was at its foundation an anti-Semitic project to de-Judaize the Bible. <laughs> and he goes, oh, that's not true, you know. And, um, but it was just amazing in, in that I was looking at this you know, this Jewish gentleman, and I said, look, I said, I'm the Gentile here. I'm the Gentile. You're supposed to be convincing me this stuff's real, not some former, you know, drug addict from South Boston convincing you that your book is true. But it just, it gripped my heart to think that even 
the people that the Lord did this for, you know, even the Jewish people, a large percentage today don't believe it. They don't believe it. And yet, I really am convinced that in the days ahead, the Lord is going to give a, a, a personal witness. He's going to, he is going to speak from heaven, and he's going to sort of pull the curtains back on this once again, and he's going to say, remember all of these things. Remember, remember the mighty things that I did when I led you out of Egypt. Remember when I, you know, I ripped the ocean in half. And uh, it's amazing. I'm sure you get into it in the film, but, you know, among scholars, there's sort of the perspective that, well, this was, it was a miracle in the sense that the winds just happened to blow at just the right way, at the right time, this type of thing, versus the idea that you really had the hand of the Lord, the, the, the nostrils of God. You know, it was a true, genuine miracle, ripping the ocean in half. In terms of that, do you, do you get into that in the film? Of, of absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, yeah, that's the question, because you'll find people of faith that take a, uh, a naturalistic look at it. So what we have is a naturalistic understanding of the Scripture, meaning that God doesn't violate the laws of nature. So they're saying that, that it, the miracle was in the timing, was that the wind blew. So they know that we'll actually show in, the, in part two uh, a wind set down models, you know, with, uh, you know, scientifically how this works. But I do know that the sea crossing it has to work with water that's about three to seven feet deep over the course of six to seven hours. You'll get a wind set down model and that'll blow the water away so that it's more like a tide. Uh, the challenge with that then comes that it's like three, three or four kilometers away. And when the Bible says that the, you know, the walls, the, the Israelites walk through what appear to be like walls of water on their left and on their right. A wind set down model doesn't doesn't satisfy to many people that uh, what description that Moses is telling us as an eyewitness account. Whereas a let's say a crossing at Nuiba Beach or somewhere in the Gulf of Aqaba, whether it's at the Straits of Tehran, uh, we're going to look at the different crossing sites. That would be more of a spectacular miracle where God, you know, the question is did God just use the wind or was he supernaturally you know dividing the water the wind was a sign for it you know I know that there's references to the Holy Spirit being like a wind or something mighty rushing wind uh, but it's a way for people to know that it was happening but, you know so is it walls of water or is it you know wind blowing off the the water that's what we're gonna look at but like we said today there's a lot of um, resistance I guess to being supernatural they're trying to find ways to, to, to say, well, how did these biblical narratives and these biblical accounts happen uh, and, and not really have a supernatural component to them? Right. Yeah, even people of faith still try to come up with sort of a naturalistic scientific explanation, and that's okay sometimes, um, but it's just when you, when you really read the language, even acknowledging that the Hebrew Bible uses hyperbole, even acknowledging that, the language there conveys, I think to anyone that reads it honestly, conveys something far beyond something that was just great timing, that was just a naturalist. I mean, either something completely supernatural happened or the entire thing's a lie, in my opinion. I just, I don't think you can just disregard it, um, disregard the language there. Like you said, walls, the water congealed, this type, you know, this type of language just by saying, well, sometimes the Hebrews use pretty flamboyant uh, hyperbole. Like, it just, it's, that's pushing things way, way too far. Language, as you said, words mean things. Language means things. Yeah, I was going to share this with you. I think that both you and I probably are understanding that unless you understand the larger narrative of what's going on, as, as you start to look at the biblical text and understand that that uh, people who only look at the New Testament uh, for Christians, let's, let's just say, they don't understand really a lot of context. They are missing a much broader understanding of God and what his, uh, what the journey, I mean, it's the whole origin. Where do we come from? That understanding the origin of our existence and then understanding this, what I always call it like an arc. There's an arc of God's narrative that basically says that there's God, uh, is outside of time and space and he called into existence uh, our universe and then there's there's understanding that man fell 
and there was a need for a, a savior. That's what the biblical text is telling us. And, uh, and so if you don't understand that from the early books of the Bible, you kind of kind of come in here and there's just a lot of pieces that are missing. And why it's interesting too, Joel, is that it says, I think almost over a hundred times, maybe hundred, I've heard up to 140 times. It says, do not forget what God did by bringing you up out of Egypt. Do not forget what God did by bringing you up out of Egypt. It's like repeating the, this constantly goes on. And actually even Stephen, I think when he's being uh, stoned, uh, uh, he's telling the whole uh, story from, I believe from Abraham all the way through to, you know, the Exodus and what happens. And he's explaining this challenge with people that keep forgetting. You, you keep forgetting. And then Jesus goes on to say, because you don't understand Moses and the prophets, you won't understand who I am. And what I learned was that a lot of scholars, in my second film, The Moses Controversy, I have scholars there that grew up in, let's say, Bible-believing homes, and now they're agnostics. And what they'll say is that, you know, they've got, there, there's lots of different dynamics to why people don't believe. And sometimes I think there's part of it that they'll, they'll try to have an intellectual argument with that. But I also know that, um, that in this um, wanting to not believe, there are other, like I said, there are other parts to it. And, and one of them is that, that uh, if they feel that the Old Testament and the events of the Old Testament didn't happen the way they, they are, they look then at the, the, the people who are speaking in the New Testament. They look at Jesus' words referencing back to Moses, and they're saying, listen, if Moses didn't exist, if these events didn't exist, then why should I believe in Jesus at all? That's what they're saying. That's what they're saying. Yep. Yep. And that's why Satan has been so aggressive. He understands that. He understands the logic of it. And that's why he's been going after this so aggressively for so long. If you can undermine Moses, you've undermined Jesus. So, Tim, um, people, uh, where, where do you want to send people? I'm going to put your website up on the screen. Where do people want to go to get more information on this? Yeah. Well, um, uh, PatternsOfEvidence.com. PatternsOfEvidence.com. For almost 20 years, I've been searching for evidence of one of the greatest miracles of the entire Bible, the miraculous parting of the Red Sea. Tim, the first question most people ask is, where's Mount Sinai? My first question as a geographer is, where was the sea that was parted and crossed? So what do you think the crossing site, where would that be? Well, for once, I'm going to follow the conventional argument here. When I look at the Exodus story through the eyes of a scientist, then it contains a lot of observations which just make sense to modern science. I think it is possible to demonstrate that it took place in close proximity to Egypt. I know that some people would say, well, there were probably 5,000, maybe 20,000 Israelites. This matter of large numbers is a very, very thorny issue. There has to be enough Israelites in order to make Pharaoh and the rest of Egypt scared. Whether the 10 plagues happened is a miracle. Whether the Red Sea parted is a miracle. Archaeology cannot prove or disprove a miracle. Make the sea small, put it close to Egypt, all of a sudden it calls into question the biblical text itself. And you cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone into mighty waters. Where were these ancient lakes and what is now all desert? And what sort of people could stand the strength of the wind that would part that depth of water? Nobody could stand and walk that land bridge mm -hmm. in that sort of wind. It would be impossible. Why is it important to think about these things? At the end of the day, we're really talking about a miraculous event of unprecedented proportion, of God's miraculous saving power. The Red Sea Miracle is a two-part film series, Fathom Event, February 18th and May 5th. If, 
as if anyone's ever seen our films before, this is going to be an evening. This is an event. Th these films are, this is going to be a two and a half hour experience. It starts right at seven o'clock. We do have a pre-show time for seating. Uh, and we're only, we're only in like 800 and something, like 10 theaters around the nation. But you need to buy your tickets in advance because a lot of the theaters, uh, we're getting, you know, theaters that are being sold out or the seats are, the best seats are going. So, and we're also telling people to bring your Bible study group or bring your Sunday school class, bring your family, bring, uh, you know, people you might have been talking with about the Bible. Because at the end of this film, we're also going to have a panel discussion and uh, like we have in the past, and in this one, it's gonna, we're going to have some people that you might know, Todd Starnes, Ken Ham. Uh, in fact, we filmed it at the Ark Encounter Auditorium, where the big Ark is. Uh, we've got Kay Arthur, uh, Janet Mefford, and uh, uh, Jeremy Lyon, a Hebrew scholar. So they're going to be, you know, at the end of the film discussing it. But these films are so big that I put an intermission into, into them, like the old, old school times when the Ten Commandments were out there. So we've got an uh, mm -hmm. intermission in the middle of this. So it's going to be a really in full evening, relaxing evening. I think you're really going to enjoy this. Uh, the audience will really enjoy it. So it's uh, Patterns of Evidence, The Red Sea Miracle. And you can go to PatternsofEvidence.com. That's PatternsofEvidence.com to get your tickets. Okay, and so, you know, I'll be putting this interview up on YouTube, so some people will see this beforehand, some will see it after. But the first film, tell me if I have this right, is the release is Feb February 18th, whereas part two is May, May 5th? 5th? Yes. yes. Okay. okay, so really back-to-back. -back. You're releasing these back-to-back. -back. I love that you're doing it with an intermission, by the way. You know, everybody's trying to make everything shorter to appeal to the short attention span. And I love people who just buck the trend and say, forget about it. We're going back to classic theater, intermissions, long films, epic films. I, I, I'm a big fan. You're going to get your money's worth. It's, uh, you know, if you get there early, it's going to be a two and a half hour to three hour experience because uh, it is an experience. And I think people are going to come away. Uh, like I said, some people think that this is the the, you know, the best film that we've ever done. Well, uh, we, we, we have, we have, uh, right now I probably have about five more, four, four more films that I have quite a bit in the can. Uh, so after this, we got Journey to Mount Sinai, which we'll explore where is Mount Sinai. We got then Mountain of God, what happened at the mountain. Then we've got the conquest, uh, and uh, then we move into the you know uh, early uh, Judges period. So we're going to be working our way uh, through the Old Testament because uh, eventually, plus we started in Exodus. You know, uh, there's still. Um, other things in Genesis that we haven't covered yet. And so the plan and the vision is um, to look at about, I've, we've outlined about 50 hours, and there was still more that we didn't outline, but we have about 50 hours of, of biblical investigative uh, material that is officially outlined. We you know, developed a brochure and everything. So uh, I just felt like if, if someone ever asked me, well, what would you do if you could? If you had the resources, what would you do? I already put it together. <laughs> so it's quite a bit. Awesome. Awesome. Super cool. I'm glad you got plenty more coming. You know, if you keep going, if you keep going, you could actually get Donald Trump to actually play Cyrus. That would be good. That would be good film right there. All right. Just kidding. Just kidding. All right. Well, uh, Tim, thank you so much for being on with us. Um, I trust that everyone watching is going to go on to Patterns of Evidence and put in your, um, you know, get, get your tickets ahead of time. But this is a project that is worth our support and so if you're watching get your tickets go support it but also pray pray for tim pray for his family pray for his wife pray for their film crew pray for all of these projects coming up i really believe that this is something it's kind of it's off a lot of people's radar um, but i think it's a project right now that is something the lord is anointing in a powerful way and i think we're going to look back at this and say this is something the lord has been behind. It's been a profound instrument in his hand to awaken a lot of people. So don't just go and support it by seeing it, but also get behind him and pray for everything that the Lord's given him to do. So Tim, thanks so much for being on with us. Thank you very much for having me, Joel. All right. Well, that's all the time that we have for this episode. Look forward to seeing you all next time. Until then, I'm Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground.